Welcome to Courtney on Health with uh, heard on MalcolmPresents.com. Maxine, introduce Courtney as you usually do. Hey, Courtney. I, pronounce, I always pr mispronounce her last name. I Great, know. Right? We can't take you anywhere. So, Courtney, hello. Hello. Uh, and welcome to your show, Courtney on Health. It's got your name and everything. Uh, a Zoom cast series about how to get through these lingering COVID times. It seems like it doesn't want to go away uh, with tips on nutrition and exercise given by the wonderful, talented and terrific Courtney Gravenies. Uh, the, who, she's a registered dietitian and she's got a master's of science degree in nutrition and applied physiology, which is pretty awesome. She knows uh, everything. She, she's an experienced yeah. nutritional and health consultant in the New York metro area and will help guide you on a path to wellness and health. So I did a couple of drafts of this intro today and this is what I'm left with. Uh, <laughs> I had to throw in a, a some sort of poem. So this, yeah. is, this is it. It's called The Eyes. And it's written by Tree Rider 73, whoever that might be. And here we go. Looking down, it's looking back at me. I want to look away, but can't. Toss it, but I keep looking. It's staring at me. Why is it staring? My potato. Something is wrong with it. That's it. Short and sweet. <laughs> And here, and it leads into this subject that we're talking about today in a very strange way. Potatoes? It's, well, potatoes are, are part of this, this myth that we're going to go into. There are many myths about food, like eggs. Are they bad for you? We think twice about eating a potato. Why? We are told not to eat too many eggs, especially the yolks. Stay away from potatoes as they are too starchy, have too many carbs and calories. Those are myths. And a myth is defined as a widely held but false belief or idea. In this episode, Courtney will dispel some of the myth myths about nutrition. There are certain, certain foods which people might think are bad, but are actually packed with vitamins and minerals which are healthy. La Rocher Foucault said, to eat is a necessity, but to eat intelligently is an art. So let's demystify some of the foods that get a bad rap and let the nutritional facts take center stage. There is an art to eating, so let's find out how to create a healthy food palette. So Courtney, you're gonna help create that palette because uh, uh, we wanna know what some of these nutritional myths are uh, and are, what our listeners should look out for. So can you start us off with, with that? Sure. Gosh, I'm trying to think where to, where to start, where to start. But um, yeah, some of these myths are probably maybe ones you've heard before, but for whatever reason, they just won't die, right? They, I feel like every few years, they come back up again. At the top of that list is the eating after eight. I've been hearing this one for a long time. So um, never eating after eight. Um, eating after eight is automatically going to is unhealthy for you and will cause you to gain weight. So let's let's unpack that one a little bit. So certainly for digestion, for sleep, uh, if you have diseases like reflux or you know GERDs, it's probably not the best idea to eat on a regular basis late at night. But there is nothing magical about the calories you consume after eight o'clock at night that are automatically going to get attached to your rear end or your hips or your legs. It doesn't work that way. We work on a roughly 24 hour, even longer than that clock of a calorie amount that we need to maintain our weight. It's different for everybody. Um, I'm in the ballpark, but it's different for everybody. Maybe because you eat calories after eight o'clock at night doesn't mean it's going to get stored as fat. So for example, if I need 2000 calories to maintain my weight, and, and I'm not suggesting this is healthy to do, I don't eat anything during the day because I'm busy, whatever, and I don't get around to eating my meal until you know nine o'clock at night, but I only eat a thousand calories. Simply because I ate it after eight o'clock, 
doesn't mean I'm going to lay that down as fat. My body is going to put that towards its need for my body, bodily processes. Um, not just the time, it is the total amount of calories in the day. Now I will say, having worked with a, you know, a variety of clients and groups before, sometimes that after eight o'clock eating or after nine o'clock eating or midnight snacking, those calories are oftentimes on top of what your needs already are. So in many cases, it could lead to weight gain, not because of the clock, but because it's more calories than your body simply needs. Yeah, I, I have a question for you. Are all calories burnt the same way and the same speed? From what I understand, it's you eat certain foods that you can digest much simpler and it doesn't go into storage or whatever you would call it. And there are other foods that uh, if you eat are gonna stay in the body and it's hard to digest. So uh, are, are there foods, that, you know, it's a calorie, a calorie, or are there different calories pertaining to the, uh, what food you eat? Um, a calorie is, is certainly a calorie, but as we've discussed before, two things. Uh, certainly high in fat, higher in fat and higher in protein will take longer to digest and break down. So they keep you fuller longer. So if you're trying to lose weight and you're consumed during the day, most part of the day, this is actually a good thing because you're less likely to overeat because you're, you're satisfied, right? You're, you're feeling full. It's not such a great thing if you are on a regular basis, again, not simply because of it's automatically gonna go lay down as fat, because it does take longer to leave your digestive tract. You're trying to go to sleep at the same time that your body is trying to break down, in particular, fatty foods that take longer to break down. Um, so sometimes the recommendation would be, well, maybe at night you might want to have a slightly higher carbohydrate meal because those are typically, um, you know, uh, more easily broken down. Now, of course, there's complex carbohydrates, fiber and things like that can, that can interfere. So they are not absorbed the same way. No, they're not. Mm, interesting. I know in Europe, they eat late. I mean, I know going, when I was traveling, um, you know, they have these long siestas at lunchtime and then they go back to work and then they're eating at nine, 10 o'clock at night. And it's just, I would always, and they're thin. A lot of them are just thin, you know, in France and Italy, it's like, what, you know, how do they maintain that? But they're eating diets that are different than lot, what the lot, Americans can A lot of wine. You know, a lot of wine about, yeah. hey, if you drink wine too late, is that going to keep you up? Um, well, if you get, if you get too polluted, yeah, it's going to interfere with your sleep. <laughs> you don't want that. <laughs> you're going to get a little bit too wasted, but you know, it, uh, it's, after all, it is wine. Well, so, you know, people have, so, and I get, and I, I feel like, I, you know, my, I have a family member who's like, I don't eat after, you know, five o'clock at night. And I suppose, you know what, if you're eating regularly throughout the day and like, you listen, well, there's all types to eat right we're not cookie cut. we're not meant to eat that. but I, my issue is when some of these myths get pushed out there through a variety of different reasons uh, social media uh, testimonials by famous people you name it that get pushed out there as this is science when really it's it's opinion and you're entitled to an opinion but it's not science so if it's it's really shouldn't be something that's followed across the boards as a public health practice by everyone so, so, yeah. so what are some of the other myths that we uh so adhere to? this is i wouldn't say it's a myth i would say stay tuned because we really do need more research about it and that is that if you work out on an empty stomach so in this case it's going to be in the morning um, your body is going to burn um, fats more readily. So free up free fatty acids more readily. So in the couple of research studies that they did, again, they were small studies. Um, they did show that, um, and there's an actual way you have to be hooked up to a machine. To, I, I often get quite asked the question, how do you know what you're burning? And the reality is the substrates that are burned can be easily detected, but you have to use a certain piece of apparatus. So that's how they know. They know whether you're burning protein, fat, or carbohydrate. Um, so in these particular studies, it showed that there was a small difference. Now, is that small difference enough to make a public health message of everybody wake up in the morning and if you're and work out in the morning and work out on an empty stomach? No, we just don't have the data, but it is interesting. Um, and I think for some people that's, a, that's easier because 
most people don't want to work out in the morning after having a breakfast. Um, typically, most people don't want to work out after having any meal, irrespective of what time of the day it is. So typically, so, most people don't want to work out. And you're absolutely right. So that leads to thank you, thank you, Malcolm. Because <laughs> What I like to say, I don't like to monkey with what works for people. So if you are a morning exerciser, fantastic, then stick with it. Um, if you're able to begin a workout, you know, on, you know, with maybe a small amount of, you know, food, or if it's not a particularly strenuous exercise, um, but enjoy working out at night, um, there just isn't enough data here to suggest that this is the way to go and to be the most efficient at fat burning. It, the data is just not there. Yeah. It's interesting nonetheless, um, and it does give, you know, some options for people um, who feel like they have to eat in the morning before they work out. Now, certain yeah. people need to, you know, if you're doing a long distance training, it would be ill-advised to, you know, go out and do a two hour workout, two hour run or two hour workout session, food on board. So, um, you know, take it with a, a grain of salt. Well, what yeah. I've been, uh, I've followed, uh, you know, basic logic, which I, I've done since a teenager. When you eat, your blood goes to your stomach to help digestion and go away from your muscles. So if you're eating and uh, then you exercise the uh, the, the blood is leaving your stomach going to your muscles so it's incomplete digestion i don't know if that's relevant or not or is that a myth no no the it is absolute science that um after you've eaten okay blood is going to pull from you not all of it obviously but it's going to go um go to your digestive system so leave the extremities um and go to work you know help the process of digestion. So that is true, which is why some people, for example, might feel a little cold after eating um, because that's just a normal and that's a very normal process that's happening. So um, one of the reasons why, again, you might not want to go to bed late or regular eating um, is it takes work to food and we're not super great at trying to go to sleep while your body is actually trying to go through the process of digestion. Well, the, there is a myth uh, that that has come up to be said it's now false is about, uh, you know, your mom would say, after you eat lunch, don't go swimming. I knew you, you were can't go. go to, I can't, you can't go to the pool because uh, the you, you ate and blah, blah, blah. But your that muscle, seems to cramp. be, that, but that seems to be from what I'm reading, not true. Not you true. Any, it, it, you, not true. You're, you're saying not Definitely true. Okay. Not. No, no, no. I meant, I meant that it's, it, it, it is it's true, true or is it not true? Sorry, it's, it's true that it's a myth. You don't need to oh, wait 15 okay. minutes. If you're totally fine, if you, I mean, if you want to rest for a bit, it's, but there's nothing that's really, when you comb through, it's one of those ones that, how did it get out there? It was probably one tiny study. Some kid got sick after going in the pool, but um, yeah. Well, it's I mean, Facebook's it, fault. It's all, <laughs> that's what it is. I mean, if you're going into like, do like, you know, swim laps, like I said, for like an extended amount of time, Back to our point, once you've eaten, the blood's, you know, sort of redirected. Um, so you might not feel great, but there's nothing wrong with going back in the ocean water or pool water after you've had a, you know, a smoke. so that is, yeah, you don't need to worry about that. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would eat a, a, a Hershey's Kish in Brighton and then go into the water anyway, because no one was looking, you know, <laughs> so what the heck. But but back to like high fat foods and and the, the case about eggs, there's, there's always been an issue about eggs. I mean, I mean, I have to watch, you know, what I eat, you know, have with, with this little heart thingy. And, uh, you know, the doctor said, no, do eat some eggs. You know, it's not bad. It's actually okay. The dietitian and you're a dietitian. So what, what, what's the word on that? Why is that myth being perpetuated? Yeah. Well, some, some of the issue with eggs, um, is, a little bit of the message that gets out there because every time, and I hate to blame the media for certain things, but the reality is every time something published, a new research study published about egg consumption, it automatically gets pushed, Reuters gets, I mean, it's, and it just, it gets, you know, it, it makes news, right? So we make people crazy. So some of this is we're making people nuts over stuff that really doesn't have that much, you know, meat to it, no pun intended. So egg consumption, if you eat eggs, if you eat eggs, it's absolutely fine. It is the most digestible protein that the body can use, meaning that all protein sources 
are measured in their ability to be digested to the way the egg is. It's very bioavailable. So it's an excellent source of protein. If you don't like the yolk, fine, then get rid of it. But the message to also just eat egg whites and not egg yolks is also misguided for reasons we've mentioned before. There's choline, there's, lut there's lutein, that color that's in there. There's vitamin D in that yolk. So again, if you don't like the taste of yolk, then certainly discard it or use it somewhere put out thinking that you're doing your body a huge favor, it's simply just not grounded in science. So I'm often, often asked, how many? Can I, and I remember vividly this one class I was teaching and this guy, he was, uh, you know, looked like a, a bodybuilder. And, and he said, you know, I have six eggs every morning. And I looked at him and I'm like, huh? I'm like, unless you're plowing fields every morning, like as your like career, that might be a little over the limit. So somewhere between one to two, you can have a couple of eggs a week, but if you are having an egg a day, um, seems to support that this is absolutely fine. And remember, this is in conjunct in combination with a, a generally healthful diet. So if you're eating one egg every day, it's like, well, wait a minute, Courtney, you said I can have an egg every day, but then you're having bacon with it and it's dripping in cheese and you're having French fries later in the day and a hamburger and milkshakes and sugary stuff. Different. <laughs> My mom, my mom, God bless her, lived to 101. And she lived with me for over 10 years. And every day she would want one hard boiled egg, one orange, a piece of toast, whole grain, and coffee. Every day, pretty much. You know, unless I try to get her something, you know, on the weekends if we had pancakes or something. But she was, that's what, you know, that's what she did. No, no, you know, no fatty, just that was it. And, no matzo bread, uh, Passover. <laughs> but sometimes, um, yeah, we'd have it. She she'd make us the eggy. She would make me eggy and cheesy when I was a kid. A little cheese, a little egg. But but uh, and I still can't even get that how she did it. She whatever she did, it was perfect, and I can't duplicate that. Oh, it's special, Maxine. That that mix that she did. But anyway, but that brings so, me to with the the bed wrap that they have on dairy in general, because uh, you know aside from you know eggs. Uh, you're not supposed to eat too much butter. You're not supposed to drink too much milk. Dairy products also have a bad rap that it's unhealthy. What is the <laughs> truth? I'm glad you brought that up, Malcolm, because for the life of me, and my, my colleagues and I talk about this, I'm not sure how they label dairy, except for the fact that they're in the dairy case. They're not a, they're not dairy? They're not a dairy food. They're a, they're a protein source. It's mm. not from... Let, unless I've somehow missed that course in school somewhere, they don't come from cows, so, um, or goats or buffalo or sheep. So I don't know how that happened. But anyway, it's interesting because it's, oh, many people consider it a dairy and yeah. yet. Uh, so. that, that, that's what I classify it as. I don't know. I, I don't. And I understand I, what you're saying now. Um, but um, so can we talk a little bit about agave? Because sure. that seems you know go for it uh, that's a thing now yeah go ahead yeah sure so um so if you're not familiar with agave it has um it's slightly thinner in consistency than honey but it's a um a plant-based alternative to honey um honey obviously comes from bees um agave comes from it's the sap from a plant um we import most of it from mexico um, and I have a sidebar on that just for a second. Um, so somewhere along the way, um, uh, people got the message that it is a much better, healthier alternative to honey or to you know, regular cane sugar. Why? Because in some studies, very few studies, um, it indicated that it, you had a lower glycemic response. So if you're not familiar with what glycemic response is, it's basically your body's to a meal, particularly a meal that has carbohydrate in it, but it doesn't have to be carbohydrate alone. So generally, you want a diet for, if you in particular are diabetic, that's a low glycemic diet. For the rest of us, it's really not as impactful. We have we insulin production, a normal working pancreas, and our bodies are able, there is a rate, you know, our blood sugar is going to rise and fall. As we move throughout the day, depending on whether we're exercising, what we're eating, 
whole glycemic index became this trend and this buzz topic as being somehow that much more healthy than the other you know, sugars. The reality is it actually has roughly five calories more per teaspoon than regular table sugar. So just like if you like agave, and I'm always telling people, much like with kosher salt, if you like the flavor of kosher salt so much better, and in my opinion, quite frankly, it tastes so much better, regular granulated salt. If you're using less of it, there's a benefit there because you're just using less of that compound, so less sodium in your diet. The same thing with sweeteners. If you like the flavor of that sweetener so much that you're getting by with using less of it, therefore fewer calories, well, there's the benefit in using it. But don't, it's more expensive. So you know how I am, you guys, about spending money that you don't need to do. So um, if you love the flavor of it um, and you're using less of it overall, we're consuming fewer um, but generally, this is not something that is an automatic slam dunk, healthier alternative to any of the sweeteners. The sweeteners are all around the same um, calories, roughly. Um, and I, the low glycemic, uh, the glycemic index response, I think, has been a bit overblown, again, particularly for people who do not have diabetes. What about the low fat and the diet foods? You know, they, they, they get pushed a lot. And uh, I mean, is, is there any myth about that those things, the, the things that they sell that, you know, it's low fat, it's, it's, it's a diet thing or whatever. I mean, these labels that are put on, and then if you look at ingredients, they don't kind of jive with each other. So, right, you know, right. what's the... Well, I would, um, thanks for bringing that up. It's a great one. It's a, it's a great comment because I think a lot of us, and this is where marketing gets, um, you know, very, very tricky. You know, I think the marketers know that low carb, um, keto, this, I mean, it's, it's going to lure people in to buy it and to try it. So there is no proof to any of any of this. Um, I mean, there are some healthier low fat foods that are out there that are certainly can be part of a healthy diet. There are maybe naturally low carbohydrate foods that are health, could be part of a healthier diet, but the label alone is not going to drive that. You have to look at it. And like you said, Maxine, you've got to look at the ingredients. And if there's a bunch of stuff in there that you can't identify, um, or a, a litany of ingredients um, for something that should be super simple, you need to look at it you know, maybe with a bit of uh, a questioning eye in terms of, is it really something that's healthy for me? So there's no, none of these is if low fat, then, then good, or if low carb, then good. It all has to come down to what's in there. Is it the least processed food? Did mother nature make it low fat, low carb automatically? Um, or was there something in it that is making it that way? So well, almost have, when, I, when I look at labels now, I almost have to have, have my Google around me and say, what is that? What does that do? Because there are so many complicated words I can't even pronounce it. It's almost like a, you know, reading a foreign language. Yeah. Uh, uh, but but you can this. pronounce potato but depending if you can spell potato, potato. Uh, but but potato gets a bad rap too yeah. uh you know it's high in carbs you know it, it, it's starchy it's this and that but you know what, what's your take on 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 potatoes potatoes are an absolutely fine food typically where we most people get into trouble is what's been done to it right um, but if you think about, you know, I think your average potato um, is, pro is probably, you know, under 200 calories, even if you're getting one of the larger ones, it's high in potassium. If you're having it with the skin on, it's a great source of, uh, it's a good source of fiber, I should say, not great. Um, it's a plant, obviously a plant-based food. There's lots you can do with it. It's very forgiving. You can bake it and broil it. You can, so there's so many things. Um, so um, I think it really came down to when the sort of the low carbohydrate movement came along, anything that was in that category, meaning starchy carbohydrates, so um, corn, potatoes, um, and your sweeter vegetables, so even carrots, uh, um, and even uh, very concentrated grapes, were all getting getting thrown under the bus. Um, so it was unfair because the reality is many of us 
rates are not, um, in terms of the obesity rates in the country, if you really drill down to what's being consumed, it's not a plain white baked potato. It's probably not carrots, it's probably not grapes. It's probably the refined carbohydrates that Americans typically eat um, and not necessarily just the old potato. Um, no, it's the disco fries at the diner. <laughs> That's what kills you. <laughs> There's a diner in our area, and I, I I know the kids. They would go there all the time from the high school, and they would order these. It's called Disco Fries, right? And I'm like, it's like every gloppy, goopy, gunky stuff. Is, I mean, it's like the cheese and this. It was like, so I think that potato <laughs> would be one that hmm, not quite sure, but uh, but a good baked potato. <laughs> There, the sweet potato yam um, is, I mean, again, it's because of the protein content, um, it tends to be praised more um, and demonized less because of, you know, the powerhouse of nutrition that it tends to be. But um, you know, the plain white potato is, you know, is no slack, is all I'm saying. So you don't have to eat them, but I don't like it when these foods that can be very economical for people, you can buy a five pound bag, you can feed a family. It's good when they get demonized unnecessarily. And we push people to buy foods that are questionably healthier and in many cases more expensive. So uh, yeah. now is it true that Coca-Cola can take the rust off a carburetor? I don't know. But that's that's what I've always been told. <laughs> I, it actually can decompose a tooth. If you throw a tooth, like a kid's tooth, in a in a cup in a, a glass of uh, Coke, it actually can over time. You, you will see that it, where it, it, it the tooth dissolves a bit. That's not scientific. That's something that actually I saw happen. Yeah, but well, uh, we've certainly spoken about you know the 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 soda stuff. But while we're on beverages. Can I, can, do we have times for me to talk about alkaline water? Cause that's one. Yeah. Um, so you guys heard about, you know, um, I, I think there's a book out there. It's a popular book called Dropping Acid, but there's a variety of books out there um, about how to reduce um, the amount of acid in your body. So we, our bodies keep a, a relatively neutral pH. Um, but in order to encourage a more basic alkaline pH, um, it's been encouraged that we should be drinking more of this alkaline water. Um, so it's a huge marketing push um, out there. In my opinion, just not enough research to support it in the general population. Um, of our water we get, um, uh, I know certainly in our town, Malcolm, I'm pretty sure it's the for you as well. It tends to hover at a very neutral pH. Okay, so um, you know somewhere between you know maybe around six or seven, um, the alkaline waters uh, push it up to about eight, between eight and nine, with the theory that your body will respond better. Um, and there's a host of different reasons why the people who market these um, alkaline this is better. The only population of people where there's actually a little bit of research with some like real meat to it um, is in individuals with reflux. And again, it's very preliminary. Um, I don't think there's enough to justify the expense of the buying these waters versus good old tap water. Um, but it seems to suggest that if you have this out more alkaline based water, it might help reduce some of your reflux whereby reducing some of the acid. Um, uh, but it's, it's big right now, a lot of these waters, and that's one of the big ones that's pushed. But I do want to you know, caution anybody who's out, you, you can push your body to a point. Your body has a really nice concert going on for most of us, right? And if you overconsume very high alkaline foods, you push your body into something called metabolic alkalosis, which is not what your body wants and it's, it can be very dangerous. So just because again, you can buy it and it sounds like it's good and it's being touted as this whole miracle panacea for you know, all your ills, um, you always have to look and say, okay, what's, what are the downsides of this? Um, that being one of them. The other being your, your gut has got a nice, your stomach has um, an acidity to it. 
which actually helps us keep, uh, keeps us safe from certain bacteria. Um, it's that acid in our gut that actually deactivates or kills off some of the bad bacteria that could make us ill, which is why people who overconsume things like Tums um, tend to be at risk for illness because they've knocked out that first pass of defense that our stomachs offer. And now, now, now when I grew up, uh, drinking water out of the tap was, you know, where everybody did. In fact, the, the, you see the things drinking even water out of a garden hose and drinking, drinking directly. And all of a sudden, when I became a teenager, you had the Evian, you had the Perrier, you had the uh, you know, crystal clear water. All of a sudden, that became a big business. How good are those waters and how bad are the waters you get out of the tap? Um. I'll start with the, I know we happen to have really good tap water in our area. Most mm -hmm. of New York does actually. We're very, very lucky. I can't speak to all around the country um, because it really does depend on filtration, your pipes. Um, you can have the best water coming into your home. And if your pipes are crud, um, it, it could increase lead content, for example. So I can't speak to everywhere, but I do know most towns offer a water report um, that most pay a little bit of attention to where you get your water. Is it well water? Is it coming from a treatment plant? So um, a reservoir. So I think this is all really good information for people to know. Generally, water coming in um, is safe. That's not to say, I mean, some people really taste the mineral differences in some of these waters you spoke about, uh, Malcolm. So they like those flavors better. So although it caught, I always have to weigh out when I'm working with a client, although like I, I, I don't like tap water, but I love you know, Fiji water. And I'm like, all right, you know what? It's, 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 it's money, it's plastic. So it's mm -hmm. all of these things that, are, you know, from an environmental and from an economic perspective are not necessarily great, but I always, always in a position I got to work with people. It's like, I want you to be hydrated, certainly in days like this where it's really, really warm. So if you're telling me that's all you're going to drink, budget for it, recycle the plastic um, and, let's, and let's go from there. So some people do really taste the difference. Yeah, yeah, guys, I, ha I hate to tell you this, but our half hour is up. It's, okay. We, we, we have to do like a, uh, a marathon with this, these type of foods. Well, we'll have so to continue the subject because, uh, you know, there's, there's stuff that we never get to. So we should just do a show, stuff we never got to, you know? <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. I, I, I think that would be great. So let's all think about that. Okay. So I'll do the wrap then, okay? Okay, wrap so, it up. All right. So thanks for joining us for Courtney on Health. Uh, to get more info, follow Courtney on her Facebook page, uh, which is Courtney on Health, on Instagram at CLG Wellness. Visit her website, CourtneyGravanese.com. For more shows, go to MalcolmPresents.com and TheManyShadesOfGreen.com. Uh, you're listening to Courtney on Health, Smart Sound Nutrition, Strong Safe Fitness, and we will catch you again next time. And I'm looking forward to next week. I don't know what we're talking about, but I know it will be interesting. <laughs> It, it's going to be it's going to be what we have left off. Have a great <laughs> so, week. All right. Take care. Bye.